Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we will start the webinar in two and a half minutes. Thank you for joining us. Great, I have it as two o'clock on the dot. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webinar this afternoon. Today's webinar is all around uh, construction project management and how we can connect the office to the field using the Autodesk BIM 360 products. I'm your presenter today, Yanni Filyun. I am the head of the professional services team at Baker Baines. Now, since we are doing all of this virtually and you can't see uh, my face, I thought it would be a good idea to just quickly introduce myself to everyone so that you know who's talking to you behind the screen. Like I mentioned, I head up the professional services team at Baker Baines. I've worked on various different BIM 360 implementation projects in the last couple of years. In my previous life, I used to be a river trainer. So I do have a little bit of background and knowledge on how the software actually works and can be applied in industry did my um, diploma in interior design at UJ. And in the office, I'm known as the, the BIM queen, which is a little bit of a tongue in cheek title, but I now wear it with pride. Also, maybe just so that you get a better sense of what I'm like while I'm presenting, I talk with my hands. So even though I'm sitting at my home office behind a desk, basically talking to myself, my hands are still moving. From an agenda point of view, the things that we are going to cover today is I'm briefly going to introduce you to Baker Baines. I hope that those attending our webinar today are familiar with us and the type of work that we do. I'll touch on digital transformation and just kind of position its importance when we start looking at things like BIM 360 design and um, changing workflows in terms of connecting the office to the field. 
We'll also address some challenges and the common data environment, which is the basis for BIM 360. BIM 360 overview, um, there's two different modules for BIM 360 build that I'm going to focus on today. It's the project management module as well as the field management module. And then at the end, we will have some time for questions and answers. If you have um, any questions towards the end, we'll use the chat box and so forth to address those. But during the course of the webinar, I will also be asking you some questions in different polls, just to make sure that you are all still awake, hopefully. So who's Baker Baines? We've transformed quite a bit over the last five years and have now really become a business uh, process improvement consulting firm. A lot of you might know us maybe only as the design software people, the AutoCAD people, but our focus and specifically my focus coming from a professional services team is really helping our customers to solve their problems through digital transformation to get them um, to design better buildings or better products. We also play in the survey and the design hardware. So working with Topcon and Leica and doing scan to BIM, um, helping customers get more accurate as built. And then we're very passionate about blended learning. Uh, I think in terms of the current COVID situation, we've seen that there is a lot of benefit in doing both kind of like virtual training and online training, but still also having that um, human interaction. We do play in a various, a various different industries. It's important for me to mention because often when we start looking at things like the Burn360 technology, it really spans across multiple different industries. And we're seeing a lot of these industries are starting to converge. And what's happening in manufacturing, the building industry is looking towards that type um, of technology and innovation to see how they can make it work um, in, in the building side of things. At Baker Bands, we have our own unique consulting methodology called iAdopt. Um, this methodology that we have created for us is really all around how can we solve problems. And um, it looks beyond just the, the CAD office or the drawing office. We start looking at problems and, and the purpose of developing and implementing digital strategies improving business processes, just making sure that you're adopting the technology that you have at the moment. And it's quite a holistic approach. So we do cover you know, the people, the process and the technology aspect, right from assessment, education and consultation. And then where we need to, we jump back and forth to make sure that we always have that purpose or that problem um, in the middle. The whole philosophy behind iAdopt is to, is to drive change and to drive business improvement. There is more to this consulting methodology than what is shown on just this one slide. There is a full framework that we work uh, through with our customers to guide them through all of these different steps and our methods of engaging. So like I mentioned, I wanted to start off by just touching on this concept of digital transformation. Now, Lots of different definitions, same way, you know, if you had to go and uh, Google BIM or building information modeling, lots of different definitions. But one of the probably easiest definitions to think of if we think digital transformation is using technology and digital tools to solve problems and make things better in, in certain ways and different in certain ways. A good example of where digital transformation is not really happening so rapidly would probably be in the construction industry. So, you know, 1968, that was before I was born. So not to give away my age, but I'm not that old. <laughs> um, you know, that's kind of what a construction site looked like. And today, even if we have, um, you know, designs that are a lot different than what it used to be 40, 50 years ago, if we look at the construction site, the construction site still looks very much the same. There's not a hell of a lot that has changed. On the flip side of this, if we have a look at the manufacturing space and we have a look at what did a factory floor look like in the 60s versus what is a factory floor like um, today, there's a vast difference. There's lots of robotics and, and lot, a lot more technology being incorporated into a manufacturing space. There's some examples of digital transformation. Uh, I think a lot of you would have seen um, this, this graphic before. 
This looks at a couple of different companies. We are familiar with most of them and um, how they've changed things for us in the last couple of years. Love them or hate them. Facebook, you know, if you want your news, you don't really read the Sunday Times anymore. You probably go to Facebook. Um, taxis or at least the yellow cabs like, like we see in other parts of the world has been taken over by Uber. Uber, Uber actually owns no cars. Um, <laughs> not sure who can still remember Mr. Video, but uh, going, going to the video store on a Friday afternoon, trying to find the latest release, only to see that all the videos have already been rented. Um, it's also, it's completely a thing of the past. The way that we consume um, videos and media content has changed. And then as, as well as uh, online shopping. So they use the example of, of Amazon, which I know is also in South Africa, but probably, you know, take a lot would be um, a good idea of what we have uh, locally and how that's changed the way that we change the way that we shop. With that being said, I want to just quickly pause and see if I can ask you guys one of our poll questions. You need to give me a second so that I can go and jump to this poll. I'm launching it and I hope that you can see it. Guys, if you're wondering why is Johnny talking about shopping and not actual <laughs> um, connecting the office to the field, I promise you this this has um, as a point and we'll soon get into um, to the bulk of what this presentation is really, or what this webinar is really all about. I'm gonna give it like a couple of extra seconds for you to go and finish that poll. At the moment, we're on 82% yes, 18% no. I was kind of hoping that more people would say no. Well, whilst the, oh, don't go and change your mind now. <laughs> whilst, um, whilst the poll is going, and, and I'll just give a chance for everyone else to also go and, and add their feedback to that. The reason for me bringing up these different examples is if we have a look at this transformation of the retail space um, that Amazon or online shopping did, is a lot of people don't enjoy online shopping because you know now you have to change your mindset and you have to change your behavior. And you probably liked going into the store and fitting something, knowing that it fits, understanding the material, and then buying it. Whereas now if you're doing it online, there's, there's behaviors that need to change. Now you need to know what your measurements. Now you need to look at the model's length to know if this, the skirt's going to be sh too short. Now you have to have an understanding of, you know, if this is a synthetic material, what does that feel like? So with any of these digital transformation examples, it's important to remember that there's always a mind, a, a mind change shift that needs to happen as well as um, behaviors that need to need to change in order for it to work. And I'm mentioning this specifically because if we have a look at something like, um, thank you for answering the poll, everyone. Uh, if we have a look at something like Bone 360, it's probably going to replace paper to a certain degree or your local servers. And a lot of people like their paper <laughs> and um, like having things on, on service because it's traditional processes, it's things that they have become accustomed to. But in order to transform this area of um, connecting different individuals on a project, we need to know that certain things that we were used to in the past will be replaced. So it really brings us to a step where we have to look at how will BIM 360 interrupt or change the traditional processes? In our digital transformation world, it's no longer about the big eat the small. It's about the fast eating the slow. If we take a look at those examples of the Netflix or the Airbnb, when these companies started, they weren't massive organizations. They were just fast and first with innovation. And with the adoption of digital technologies, we're seeing more and more that smaller organizations can start bidding for bigger work because they have that technology and then the tools to, to help them do that. So that is why when, when I talk about digital transformation, it's always important for me to tell the clients that I, that I work with to say, this is something that ideally you should be proactive about. Um, if you want to change the way that you are connecting your field staff with what's happening in, um, in the office, or if you want to change the way 
that you are managing issues on site. It's best to be proactive about this so that you can be first to everything. Now, I promised you earlier that I won't talk about shopping and Uber and Facebook for <laughs> another 30 minutes. And I know that today's session really is all about how do we take these people the, the, and these people, as well as the information and the data that gets created here in the office and integrate that with what is happening on the site. This could be various different sites. It could be like the people that you are seeing on the one side of my screen, or it could be smaller interior building sites. Different ways of connecting these people to what is actually happening in the office. Now, I said that 96% uh, of all the data that, capture, that gets captured goes um, unused in a lot of the engineering and construction practices. So you might be using Revit and putting a whole bunch of information into super smart families and then no one really uses it. Not because they don't care, but perhaps they don't know it's there or perhaps they don't have the means of using that information. And then anyone who is more in the kind of uh, facility or asset management side of things will know that they estimate around 30% of initial data created during design and construction is completely lost by the project closeout. So there's a lot of information that goes missing um, or that doesn't get used throughout the life cycle of the project. This is typically why, and these are the types of issues, and, and I'd love to say, you know, raise your hand in, in the go to webinar little box if you agree with any of these or if you have experienced any of these. But unclear communication lines between teams. Anyone who's ever had an argument um, with a contractor or any contractors who's ever had an argument with an engineer or an architect or a designer will, will know that oftentimes it comes down to communication. Missing, missing project information, you know, um, it, was it on my email, was it in Dropbox, was it in WeTransfer, was that the file that was too big so I copied it on the flash drive, where do I get this information? Lack of version control and then just issues that's happening between the office and the field are often disorganized and it's quite difficult to, to check and resolve them. These types of issues land up basically costing us rework. Um, these are not, you, you'll see the sources at the bottom, unfortunately this is not based on um, South African stats. I would imagine that in South Africa it's probably even worse. But 50% of global rework is basically caused by poor communication. 13% uh, of the construction team spend their working hours looking for information. Now, if this is a, a American stat, I'm not quite sure what the South African is, um, one is, but 177 billion in labor costs were spent on doing non-optimal activities. So basically focusing on the wrong thing. A lot of these challenges and um, things that we often struggle on project delivery could be solved by a common data environment. Now, a common data environment, I think, is also something that a lot of people are quite familiar with, hopefully. If you're not, here's the quick brief description of it. And our typical workflow, that's the image in the white on my left hand side, is each individual has a whole bunch of data and information that they share with others, but it's not shared in one spot. It's shared at different times, it's shared with different people, through different means and different file formats. Whereas ideally, if you have a look at a common data environment, everything that's shared sits in a central um, data container, if I can call it that. And that is the, the basis of what Win360 is built on, is that idea of having a common data environment and having all the data and information that you share on the project in one single database. Does not mean that everyone can see everything that's going on. So there's a disclaimer on that. So that brings us to BIM 360 build and how that can, the functionality within that can help these different individuals to communicate better. From a BIM 360 point of view, I like putting up this um, just so that everyone can kind of see the lay of the land from a BIM 360 point of view. Um, BIM 360 docs or the document management, the common data environment, is the foundation of BIM 360 design, coordinate and build. Build is built on top of BIM 360 docs. So if you have access to a BIM 360 doc subscription, you automatically 
um, sorry, a build subscription, you automatically have docs. Same with coordinate, same with design. For those who are slightly familiar with BIM 360, BIM 360 build used to be called BIM 360 field back in the day. But for the purposes of today, we're just going to focus on some of the key functionalities within a BIM 360 build. Now I'm going to give you another poll. I just want to get an uh, idea of who's used any BIM 360 products before. Oftentimes you'll find that you might have used BIM 360 docs on um, a project with other consultants, just so that I can understand, you know, where can I go through it a little bit quicker and who's used it and who's not used it. So at the moment we're looking at 40% yes, 60% no. I am going to continue. If you haven't voted yet, I will leave that poll open for you to go and put in your answer. I'm glad to see that there's a couple of no's, which means that hopefully everything that I'm showing you today is new. Great, so BIM 360 build, like I uh, mentioned, there's a couple of modules that I'm going to focus on today. Firstly, it's the field management. So field management is where we talk about our issue management, our daily reports, uh, collaboration between um, the field and the office. Project management side is the uh, a, lot of, a lot of reporting in here, um, our RFIs, our assignments of different approval workflows, and just managing everything that's going on on this project within this data environment. And then BIM 360 docs or the document management module, which is then at the kind of at the foundation of BIM 360 build, giving you that central data, single data repository with all the information in. Let me go and close that poll. Thank you for everyone who voted on that. These are the main features within BIM 360 Build. So we've got our RFI tracking. Um, a lot of these types of features specifically aid in your quality and safety. We have checklist creations, daily reporting, issue management. Everything that happens can be put into certain bits of analytics and reporting. And there is also a BIM 360 cost add-on to BIM 360 build where you can manage your budgets, but it's not something that's being covered in today's session. So if this is all the different um, elements that we're going to go through. I think for me, it's important to just mention the document management part. According to the IDC, the typical knowledge worker spends about two and a half hours a day looking for information. And I think that is something that is true for people within the built environment, people in <laughs> accounting, people um, at uh, Autodesk Partners, a variety of different people will know that you know there is a lot of time that you spend looking for information. Now, specifically when it comes to project information, of course, there is so much information going around. With this common data environment, everything is at least in one place. So yes, you still need to go and search for it, but at least it's in one place. And there's a lot of smart ways uh, to search for it. You can search by document name, file number, um, file extensions, information within different PDFs, partial strings, operators, uh, quotation marks. There's a variety of different ways to go and search for the information and at least you know that all the information is in one place. Then also always when we talk about field to the office, I know that when you go out to the field, when you're on site, um, you don't always have your laptop with you. In fact, in most cases, you probably don't, but chances are you have your phone. <laughs> um, and almost everything, in fact, I actually think everything that I'm covering today does also have mobile access. So the checklist that we're talking about, mobile access, and both Android and Apple, uh, we're not you know, favoring the one over the other. Both will have access to these types of functionality on mobile. Our issue management, RFI tracking, daily logs, markups, and then something very important, I guess, specifically for South Africa, is there's an offline sync. So I know that you know we run out of data. Some sites don't have internet access. There is an offline site mode or, or, or offline sync where you can go out to sites and use the app without internet access. You can download documents before. Um, have those documents available, do your markups, comments, 
and once you get back into um, an area where you have access to uh, Wi-Fi, everything will be synced back to the cloud. To me, this is quite a, a nice feature because it makes the technology a lot more uh, usable in the South African context. So from a project management side, let's have a look at the main things that can help you connect everyone on a project. Firstly, meeting minutes. So no more hunting for lost meeting minutes, you know, questioning who received it, did this person respond, um, did we cover everything on the agenda? That's all in one single space. You can create agendas for upcoming meetings, add your um, different people who you are, are inviting to this. It's something quite new with adding Autodesk also integrated uh, Zoom into this. So if you are using this functionality, you can automatically link that to your Zoom meetings that we are all doing um, so many of lately. You can document decisions, you can have action items in here, attach documents and drawings, and it's, it's no more attaching where you have to go into your email and then remember, was it on the server, was it on um, on my desktop, was it in this folder, let's go search for the document that I need to attach to this email for the meeting minutes, all in one place. So having a look at the meeting minutes, what you can see in front of you is we are in the meeting minutes environment, and I can scroll by in weeks to see what, hap what happened. Here is a meeting, it's set as an agenda, I can see that by the orange, and on the one side of my screen, I can go and tick all the individuals who attended this meeting. This is my agenda items, everything that was addressed, I can go and change to closed. I can see there was an issue here um, around RFIs that I'm going to assign to Ben because this was not addressed in my meeting. And I'm also going to give Ben a due date to say that he needs to respond to what I've just added to him um, in a week's time. And I can go and mark this meeting agenda now as minutes. Once I have marked this as minutes, I can export it and I can also go and create a follow-up meeting. Choose my date for the follow-up meeting, set it within a week's time, uh, gives Ben some time to go and, and sort out those action items. All the items from your original agenda that was left as open would automatically copy over onto your new um, follow-up meeting. And all your meetings will have a location, a date and a time, and you can see where follow-up meetings are attached to existing meetings. Again, this can be exported and um, used again and again. Personally, I think that's quite a nice way of looking at meeting minutes. If you wanted to attach any documents to your meeting minutes, it's in there, you're already in the platform um, where you can find that information. Then your RFI tracking, another thing that happens a lot on projects. So from a BIM 360 build point of view, we can have a look at our RFIs, our progress of our RFIs, export this data because I know everything at some point still needs to be exported or archived or, or perhaps shared with someone outside of the project environment. Um, search for what sometimes ends up as being quite a vast amount of RFIs by different methods. We can assign these RFIs, again, similar to what you would have seen in the meetings where I can assign a task to someone and give them um, a due date. I can do the same thing within the RFI space. These RFIs can be attached to your 2D or 3D drawings. So you can pinpoint it and I'll show you that to pinpoint it to a very specific place so that you know exactly where that RFI um, is coming from. Again, you can create this on your mobile. We understand that you are, if you are out on the field, you probably have your phone with you and you can create your RFIs using your phone, attaching photos to it and that type of thing. Also, you can start tracking the, the change orders. There's an option of creating a possible change order from an R, uh, uh, RFI. And then later on, you can have a look at the reporting around how many RFIs have actually resulted into a, um, into a change order. Everything within the BIM 360 environment has a lot of security and permissions set up. So we always say it's centrally stored but selectively shared. Just because everything is sitting in that common data environment does not say, does not mean anyone can do anything with that piece of information. So your RFI workflow will typically go either your creator or your manager will create your RFI. 
um, that RFI has a compliance check. So we can say, is that RFI good? No, it's not. Go and edit it. Give me all the information that I need. Or is that RFI compliant? Yes, it is. If that RFI is compliant, it gets submitted to the reviewer. Now, we talk about reviewer. You can set up who the reviewer is uh, on your project or your uh, organization. They can have a look at additional responses, um, review the official responses, return that back to the RFI manager. The RFI manager can then say, you know, is this response acceptable? Yes, cool. Let's notify whoever we have to notify if anything needs to change or be amended. If it's not, please go back to the reviewer and say to the reviewer, not happy with your response here. Please have a look at it. Now, a good example of uh, uh, RFI, if we have a look here, after reviewing the design of the structural footings, say, for example, the concrete contractor issued an RFI out over her concerns about the rebar. And she can see the rebar in 3D because BIM 362 also supports 3D if that was created um, as a 3D BIM model. So she's specifically concerned about the congestion and seems to believe that it will be causing a couple of problems around the coverage and just general constructability. Within that RFI that she can uh, she creates, she also can automatically include a suggested answer to say, you know, instead of just sending this out and waiting for everyone on the project to come up with their own possible solution, we could say, we suggest widening the beam um, to ease the constructability of it and then create her RFI. So these RFIs uh, often, does, often reduces the number of issues reaching the site. In this case, before we actually built it and then realized you know, it's, dif it's difficult to cover that rebar, we can raise that before it becomes an issue. The percentage of the RFI responses which uh, confirm or amend previous issues, that type of information can be logged into, into the system. You can also have a look at your overall cost of change orders resulting from, from your RFIs, the number of RFIs open by age. So on average, how long does it, does it take someone to um, respond to a specific RFI? But let me show you what this looks like in the product. Hold on, let me just jump in here. Right, so here I am in my document environment and I've opened a floor plan and I'm going to create an RFI and attach that RFI to the cable tray, say we want to change the cable tray position. I've assigned it both in, um, to a person with a co-reviewer, added a due date, um, added my question. I can go and add things like a cost impact or a schedule impact or a priority or the discipline of it. I can also have a distribution list. Um, all of these activities are logged within my RFIs and I can go to a report to see, well, she hopes a little bit um, behind on his RFI responses. RFIs can also be exported either in a report or once sort of if you need to let someone else know about that. Again, if you are attaching anything, you can attach it straight out of your BIM 360 environment. So any supporting information um, that you want can be attached to your RFIs. And in the case that we that I had just shown, this is actually our office. Um, we, we had to work around the cable trays and that specific RFI can be pinpointed to the exact location so that there's no um, questions around, was it this part of the building or that part of the building that you were referring to? Then let's have a look at submittal tracking. So submittal tracking is usually, you know, part of um, contractual procedures that's required from your um, shop drawings and those types of things. So again, everything, one single spot, there's a library of all of these submittals. Um, we can sort them, we can track them, we can create them in packages to make it to make it easier. We can review our submittals, we can reject our submittals, attach documentation that supports those submittals. If these submittals um, come from an issue or if there is an issue created out of the submittal process, it can be added in here. Assign these submittals for review or approval or acceptance um, to multiple different team members or roles or companies. And also do it from your mobile device. 
So to give you an idea of the, um, the submittals workflow, is your submittal manager will create your submittal item and assign that to the responsible contractor. The responsible um, contractor, main contractor, gen, uh, general contractor typically will submit that to the manager and review for compliance. That will then be created in a um, submittal package and distributed for review. Your reviewer gets notification of that. They can use the markup and to respond to the submittal items and um, give the official response to say they're happy with the specs or they're happy with the installation. Um, submit to manager. If everything is approved, yes, we close it out, it gets distributed, and we have an audit trail of this whole approval and of that specific um, submittal being approved. If not, go back to the start and update this. Again, to look at an example, so, you know, performance specification for a cladding um, contractor, we need to submit um, what, like, what's our shop drawings, and um, it's part of the con contractual procedures. A good example of this, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but um, in 1981, uh, the Hyatt Regency walkway in the States collapsed. Um, if we looked at submittal processes and submittal processes not being thorough enough, we can see that it can actually have quite dangerous consequences. So originally the walkway was designed with a box beam um, uh, on the fourth floor, and it was designed to carry only the load off the fourth floor, like you can see in that image. The walkway, however, was built slightly differently. Um, so a box beam, fourth floor, carried both the load of the fourth floor and the second floor. So if this in today's technology world was submitted um, as, as a submittal to an engineer, an engineer would have looked at this going, Short, supporting two loads, I'm probably not going to um, approve that. But but the result of that was uh, that, you know, you can see from the images there, the upper hanger actually pulled out of that box beam and the bridge collapsed. Uh, and I think according to what I've read around this, before the Twin Towers, this was the largest um, construction issue that resulted in quite a variety, of, uh, quite a large number of, um, of deaths. So <laughs> quality and safety definitely can have quite a, uh, a big impact on our um, submittals and just generally how we approve and manage things on site. Here also from a submittal point of view for BIM 360 Gold, you can have a look at the submittals by trade. Who of them require more than two resubmissions? Um, how many of these submittals require resubmission to track health and safety? There's a variety of different things that you can look into. Or also, what's the average time spent to approve submittals? If you are hearing my dogs bark in the background, I'm terribly sorry about that. Now let's have a look at the submittal process. So here we're doing hollow metal door frames. I've attached a spec to it give it a title, a description. Um, I'm not creating it in a package as yet. And I've assigned it to John. John can open this, add in some information in PDF and submit that for review. Once we're in a review stage, I can say, okay, Brad needs to review this. He needs to review this by the 28th. Um, Brad gets it with all the information. He can approve it. He can approve it with a note, um, but he's luckily approved it and just said it's fine good to go and we can close and distribute that. Pick our distribution list and say who needs to be notified about this um, specific submittal and they can get going. And again, all your information, your attachment is a part of a, um, a specific package, everything in one place. Next up, from a project management point of view, I'm talking about, oh, you can see this in a report and you can see this in a report and you can export that. There's project dashboards for that to make visualizing all of these different project trends um, a lot easier. So your quality, your safety, your project controls, you can all see within your project dashboard, either on your computer, on your mobile device or on a tablet. There's also a card library. Um, where you can access partner cards. So there's integration intelligence to things like Power BI, if you wanted to have a look at that. 
but let me show you what that looks like. So this is a project home dashboard. If you are using BIM 360 design, and you can have your design packages, but let's move the open RFIs and submittals to the top. So here we can see how many RFIs are open, how many are, um, you know, how many do I need to respond to? So I can go and click on respond there. You can also have a look at your, your um, health and safety, your risk on different projects, see how many things are being affected. This project is high risk today. There's a whole bunch of issues coming from our contractors. Um, there's quite a lot of overdue issues on this project. A lot of it's got to do with water risk issues. If I look at a broader space, I can see all my different projects and see, you know, which projects do I need to go and focus on where are they in the world? Are they assigned to um, sub-segments within, within my business? And these card libraries, like I mentioned, can be moved so that, you know, whichever individual needs to report on something can have a dashboard that suits them. And then the reports out of this, there's a whole lot of reports that you can get. Something that I find very useful is that there is the, the option of scheduling reports based on the filter criteria. So if every Wednesday, you need to do a report on the amount of safety issues. You can set that up so that it automatically runs every Wednesday. Great, so I don't know if everyone is still with us, so I'm going to go and open um, uh, another poll for you guys. Uh, launch it, there you go. So I uh, hope you can see the poll that I've just opened, basically I just wanted to get a sense of um, what what type of organization you're from. So are you more from the kind of like contractor, subcontractor, um, field environment, architecture, uh, perhaps you either are or work for an organization that is more on the asset owner side of things, engineering or design. A lot of engineering at the moment, 17% design. Some architecture, good to know. No one in the in the asset owner space, and no one from a kind of contractor subcontractor field environment. Great. Again, I'm going to leave that poll open for a little bit longer while I give the rest of you a chance to go and voice your opinions, and I'm going to jump onto the next piece within the BIM 360 build space, which is the field management. So if the first bit was more for the guys in the office and the guys in the office managing everything that's going on in the project, this is more for the guys out in the field. So firstly, daily reporting. Let's jump in here, there you go. So our site diaries or our daily logs. From a legal point of view, it's very useful to document what happens on site every day. And again, do this with your mobile, get your weather automatically, um, or it can override your manual input and add some weather notes. So you know, if that specific day you couldn't do your concrete pour because there were flash floods, go and make a note of that um, on the daily diary. So that whenever there's any issues in the project at a later stage, you can go back and see, oh, that's why we were delayed on that, that specific um, bit of the project because we had weather issues. You can also add your labor, um, companies on site, how many workers, how many hours, uh, add photos and notes. So say, for example, you say um, there were super high winds, but the weather on your app does not agree with you. You can go and take a picture um, of the winds and the flash flood, flash flood to support <laughs> what you're logging in your, in your daily log. And just describe any other types of events that's happening on the site that's worth making a note of. And this is a quick and easy, open your phone, type in two aspects, and um, that's it. I'm going to, before I jump on to the next bit, let me just go and close the poll. Thank you everyone who voted. There you go. Great, so Quickly, this is what it looks like. You can see there's weather at the top, general notes at the bottom. Here I can add my labor, I can publish it to a specific day. Some people do this daily, and that's called daily logs, but you can also do it weekly. Um, and you can add the amount of workers or the weather. 
um, it does also come in Celsius and add any notes or photos to your daily diary. Issue management. So issue management is both part of BIM 360 build, but if you have used BIM 360 docs before, you'll know that the issue management is also part of that. So from an issue point of view, really you can assign issues to people, but I think a good thing around this is to get an idea of what's the root cause of that. Because there's one thing just assigning issues, it's wonderful that you have a platform that can assign issues, but you also need to get to the root cause so that you can start avoiding issues rather than, rather than just assigning issues all the time. On your mobile device, you can add a little bit more context by adding a photo so that people can get a visual of the issue that you are referring to, respond to these issues. They also have different statuses, um, export them, track them, report back on them, assign them to different team members, um, so either a team member or an individual or a role or a company. So let's have a look at the issues. We can see here a couple of issues. Bob the Builder has a lot of issues. They're all in red, which means he is not doing what he needs to. Um, I can see I had assigned this to him. No attachment. Uh, here's another one. Um, in this case, it does have a root cause, also an image that we've attached here. Uh, just to give it a little bit more information. But I'm going to go and create a new one, and I'm creating a Baker Baines issue. You can create your own type of issues um, if, the, if the suggested list does not suit your type of project. I'm assigning it to Shahab. He's my colleague. He gets, you know, kind of all the RFIs. Um, and I can go into my document man management and choose which document I want to use to support this issue. Now I'm using, again, I'm using our um, office floor plan. Anyone's interested, our office is the area to the right. Um, and I'm going to go and create an issue there in reception. I'm going to say, let's call it a code compliance root cause. You can go and create different types of root causes, but there's quite a comprehensive list already. And let's just say here we have an issue around the reception not really being COVID compliant because everyone's kind of sitting on each other's laps how you see this dashboard in terms of the attributes can be adjusted and here i can see there's root cause for code compliance some for design deficiency workmanship communication i can see where documents have been linked and i can see that between bob the builder and shuhab they have a whole bunch of issues that they need to respond to and one of my issues have been closed out yeah so checklist creation these different varieties of checklist creations that um, you can do quality safety punch list checklists all of that basically falls under the, the checklist creation category all of that very useful on your mobile device you can create existing checklists um, you can import existing checklists that you already have in your organization that you're using or you cr can create them from scratch so the idea of having a punch list or a checklist is nothing new. Chances are you probably have something. Um, maybe it's on Excel, maybe it's on, you know, written down in a book that you take to site. So a lot of these already exist. You can create quality safety commissioning, punch lists, you know, anything that you can think of that is a list that people need to give a specific answer to can be a checklist. Build your templates. Um, you can also sort, sort and track these. Uh, different different checklists, which ones have been completed, which ones not, um, who has it been completed by, that type of thing. Around our quality controls, so if we had to do a, a quality checklist, just to have a look at what that workflow will look like. So we'll start by initiating the, the checklist done by the inspector. They will review the ind individual items. Um, if they have noticed any deficiencies, oh, a de defect, they will automatically create an issue. So there's no tick, no, this thing does not, this thing is not right. And then separately, I must remember to go send an email to do to do this. While I'm there, as soon as I say, no, something, um, something is not right, I can go and create an issue. And then we go into that issue workflow that I've just shown you. If everything in the checklist is right, no problem, complete the checklist, um, all the sections, submit the checklist, and we can run our report to say, it's been done. Um, let's have a look at a at an example here. So here we're just doing like a general punch list um, of of an of the office space, assigning it to John. We can say exactly where and when we are 
are doing this and let's go run our checklist. So here we have a yes, no, not applicable option. You can have a conform, non-conform. You can have a installed, not installed. You can have a A, B, C, D, E. Any kind of um, options you can go and add in here. Here I've seen that there is actually a defect around the ceiling tile. So I've clicked no and I'm automatically creating an issue on this checklist. Um, probably due to water, I'm going to go and just assign it to a company because I'm not really sure who the individual person is. I've assigned it to someone and they know which location I'm referring to. Um, I can add a root cause, probably weather related, um, if we were having flash floods. And on that checklist, you can see there's my issue. Um, it has already been created. I can also go and uh, attach a photo if I wanted to attach a photo of the ceiling tile um, that had some water damage on it. And then if you have a look on the left-hand side, you can see which checklists are in progress, which haven't been started, which are completed, if they are completed by when, um, when were they completed by who, and so forth. Safety management, similar type of thing. Again, you can do it on your phone. Um, this type of checklist really can help encourage safety programs because it's something that can be pre-set up as soon as you get onto the site in the morning, go, okay, I have to quickly check everyone is wearing um, their correct gear or I need to check that there's no um, tripping hazards. Everything can be checked um, on different types of platforms. We can share these checklists and these observations with other people, um, track, and many, track and manage any of the issues that result from that, like you see here on the one side, you can go and just take that photo with your phone. Again, identify the root cause. If we get the root cause, we can um, start <laughs> avoiding issues rather than just reporting on them. Very similar type of workflow. We initiate the checklist. Were any safe behaviors noted? No, wonderful, complete the checklist, run it, move on. Um, if, the, if we did spot any unsafe behaviors or any unsafe elements on um, on site, we can go and initiate an issue, uh, assign that to a person, create a root cause, and submit that issue so that we have a track record of that. Here again, in terms of the checklist, the checklist, whether it's a safety or a quality, it all kind of works the same, but in this case, we're just going, yes, 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 window frame's fine, window gasket's fine, the door's fine, the door hardware's fine. Um, you can also add a note to these types of things and go through your, your checklists and manage any, everything in one central space. Great guys, so with that being said, that is the, the overview of the project management and field management components within BIM 360 Build. There's a lot more that you can do with this platform. They've recently introduced, if I say that, Autodesk have recently introduced um, asset and equipment tracking within BIM 360 Build, and there's a couple of other uh, tools and features that we didn't have time to cover today. Just in summary, a lot of people that we're finding and the projects from a BIM 360 point of view that I'm working on specifically chose BIM 360 because it's so connected and data driven, um, and also the, the security aspects around it. For a lot of people, hosting information in the cloud is a problem. Um, not only is the security around the permission controls on who can see what and who can do what, but the actual um, cloud environment is also protected. They do use Amazon Web Services to host this information and you actually have a choice between um, a US and a, a Euro-based environment for your data. Web360 as a whole is an open API and it integrates with a whole bunch of other types of formats which is nice because if you've seen what I've shown you today and go, yes, that's really nice, but if only we can change it like this, like this to uh, be a part of perhaps an existing system or an existing workflow that you have, it does have an uh, open API with a whole bunch of integrations. So lastly, if we look back at our, our digital transformation examples and we now throw in BIM360 there with some of the information that I've shared to, with you today, you can really see how it becomes the integrated construction um, management software and it's your central project database for all information and communication in one spot. Now, you know, 
have to end off with an epic photo and like a, a inspirational message on a Friday afternoon. Transformation is really not a one sort of thing. This is not a five and three sixty learn how to use and done. I've just transformed the way that I manage projects and the way that I integrate the office in the field. It's a journey. There are different steps and things that you need to take to to ultimately get there to get to that transformation. No, I think that's enough for me now, and I want to open it up for questions. I am monitoring the question box here. I actually see that there's already a question. Um, let me pop it out. Lindiwe is asking around BIM 360 and its use for Inventor, um, specifically for heavy machinery model designs. So, Lindiwe, I'm not quite sure if I understand your question around how does BIM 360 help with the design of heavy machinery, um, but BIM 360 does support a variety of different um, file formats and and a lot of instances we're finding that a lot of our inventor users are quite prone to use technology like um, Vault because that is um, what is very popular in the um, manufacturing space. But Mindewe, you're, you're welcome to type some more information um, so that I can get some clarity on that question that you're asking. Great. Any other questions, guys? We're we're almost at the um, at the three o'clock mark. So if there's not a whole bunch of other questions, I am going to share some of our details with you, and you're more than welcome to get in afterwards. There you go. So this webinar has also been well is being recorded. Uh, it will be shared on our YouTube page. You can engage with us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, if you wanted to engage with me on a social media platform, LinkedIn is probably your best bet um, for those who are a Baker Baines existing customer. You're welcome to contact our support desk if you have any issues with any of the existing software and subscriptions that you already have. Great, thank you everyone. Um, I'm in the background just le uh, reading Lindiwe's last question here. If anyone else has any questions to add, please do so. If you don't, thank you very much for joining this webinar. I hope you found it useful. Uh, if you weren't familiar with BIM 360 before, I hope this is something that uh, sparked your interest and please have a chat to either myself or those of you who know me or anyone at Baker Baines for more information.